All right, so uh, welcome back, everyone. I hope you had enjoyed your short break. Uh, these are the last two uh, sessions, last two hours of our uh, financial intelligence uh, program. Uh, okay, all right, sorry, I had a message from our friends in Port Hardcore. Uh, so uh, these two last two hours, we're going to bring kind of everything together. Uh, we have learned a lot of different, we've uh, talked about a lot of different topics from the beginning, our spiritual aspects, the uh, different topics in here. And uh, while the concentration has been on personal finances or maybe business finances, but we are hoping that we all learn how to utilize these uh, tools into benefiting our communities and enhancing uh, what's happening in our communities uh, through different ways, through our creativity, through our entrepreneurship, through a lot of different things. Um, so uh, the first session, uh, Nari is gonna do that. It's concentrating on social action, uh, kind of identifying uh, what challenges exist in our community and how we can begin to uh, work with our neighbors, with our friends to elevate these conditions. Um, and for that, uh, we compiled uh, from everyone who completed their responsibility lesson. Uh, we pulled all the uh, uh, challenges that they put in their local community. There are lists, we'll uh, share them with you. And then see what are some of the guidelines of how we can maybe approach these just as an example. We are not concentrating on the uh, uh, the exact uh, challenges that are that you have listed, but using these as an example in here. Uh, so, Nari, it's yours. What would you like to start? You're muted. Nari, you're muted. <laughs> we let's can't go, read your lips. Let, yeah, let's go into the slide, Alex. Okay, we're going to the slide. All right, sounds good. I may pull that up. Uh, framework. All right. And one, this one. Okay, great. So uh, we are just going to kind of dig in and go, th we're going to go through these slides. And as we uh, talk through this, uh, definitely, I'm sure a lot of you will have uh, comments and uh, some examples for us. Um, even in all the lessons we've already done, there are times we've talked about our different communities, things our communities are facing, uh, different issues. And a lot of times those, some of those things can seem very overwhelming. And a lot of the time uh, we look for other different sources of how to address uh, our concerns. And uh, what we wanna talk about uh, in this session is how we um, as local communities can uh, take some responsibility and take some action to address concerns without waiting uh, for schools or government agencies or uh, nonprofits or others uh, to address things, but uh, feel like we can be empowered as local communities to address uh, different conditions that we're concerned with. And uh, the framework we're gonna be talking about uh, really can uh, be uh, put in place at a, at a, in a neighborhood, in a community, um, uh, your, maybe your local uh, house of worship uh, can drive some of it. Um, uh, some uh, A civic group uh, might be able to drive some of it uh, so that you aren't necessarily waiting for the formal uh, structure of, 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 uh, the, of the society, of the government or businesses to address it but really uh, more at a grassroots level to try to uh, make some differences in uh, the conditions uh, that we uh, see around us. And so uh, we can go on to the next slide, Alex. Okay. Yeah. All right, there are a lot of different forces um, uh, that we see and, and it's come up in so many of our conversations, even though uh, these sessions we've been in have been about finances, 
but a lot of the things on this list, we all know that the, these are things that have come up, uh, whether it's entertainment and uh, you know our phones and uh, how, how that affects the way we use our time and our money. Um, and a lot of the uh, advertising that hits us and then uh, perhaps influences us in, in what we're doing with our time and with our money. Uh, all of those different things um, do have an influence and they influence our society. And uh, too often they're, they're influencing it in a negative way. And so we have to really be proactive about overcoming that and addressing it in our communities. Next slide, Alex. So, so maybe before we can go to the next slide is ask a question uh, of uh, what is it, uh, what, what do participants feel? Uh, should we rely, I'm just going to go back to the previous slide, should we rely on governments and schools and uh, uh, NGOs uh, to solve the problems of the society or do you think as individuals we have a part in it? Um, what are some of the thoughts? If anybody wants to open their microphone or just put it in the chat. And then, uh, so just, just have that in there and then we'll jump into uh, the next um, slide. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Nari. Okay. okay, and so uh, this slide kind of talks about um, that we expect, a lot, well, that's our question. There are times we expect institutions to save people, uh, but uh, the educational challenges that many of us are facing, um, and this kind of is more from uh, the American perspective, uh, but from working with different groups, we know that uh, these seem to be universal challenges. Um, and educationally, you can see the quote there, any child who's not reading fairly well by the end of third grade is unlikely to graduate high school. Uh, that is a big concern um, here in the West uh, because education is such a strong key to succeeding in life. It's very difficult to really succeed in our culture uh, without a good education. And so uh, it ends up affecting um, you know, it affects the, from the classroom, it then affects uh, the adult life. And before you know it, you know, you're, you're kind of drowning and wondering what to do uh, with, with the neighborhood, what to do with the school, all those kinds of questions. And what I'd like to see in the chat is um, what, what are some of the floodgates that your community is dealing with? What are some of the things that you know are challenging uh, just your local community that, um, that you see happening. So if we could put that in the chat. Now so we can go on to the next slide while folks are getting a chance to answer okay. that. Let me, let me type that, what are some of the challenges? Yes, thank you. Uh, maybe before we go to the solution, we can at least share, how about if I share the ones that we pulled from the uh, worksheet? Uh, so we at least get some, some ideas. Yes, uh, yep. for sure. So, yes. so these are the ones that I have pulled from uh, the, uh, the first column. Uh, this one is the challenges uh, that some of you have mentioned uh, in different countries. Uh, and then these are some of the uh, solutions uh, that you have provided in there. Uh, some of them, I okay. think, go ahead, Mary. All right, yeah, I was just kind of looking through some of these because, and you, you sort of grouped them, I think. Did you? Uh, yeah. they're, they're by, they're so by individual. In, infrastructure issues, uh, cash issues, education issues. I, I think right. some of them that we were even talking about last session was unemployment among mm -hmm. young people. Yeah. Um, I, I have seen a lot of uh, people um, say that youth have no uh, direction in their lives. Uh, mm -hmm. They are just uh, wasting their time on social media, uh, mm -hmm. playing games, social media, and all of that. So these are some of the uh, challenges that have been listed. It was actually very interesting. Uh, Clinton knows in one of the uh, group chats that he has on WhatsApp, uh, mm -hmm. I think it was a few weeks ago, uh, a parent posted in there 
um, that their young children, I think age 12, 13, were engaged in sexual activities at school. And the mm -hmm. parents was blaming the school for providing an environment where that kind of activity was uh, accepted. Yeah, not necessarily, in, not necessarily encouraged, but it's like the blame has been on the institution, on the school. Um, so that immediately raised my thought that uh, maybe we should take some more action uh, as, as individuals. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Because okay. hopefully it at home, if you're learning something's unacceptable, then when you go to the school, you, you wouldn't participate in that. Yeah. Okay. okay. This is what we saw last week too. After the 30 minute break, everybody gets quiet. <laughs> we're just barely uh, awake. We're barely okay. awake. All right. Okay, we'll go on to the next one. Okay, so and uh, so we've got a quote here: "Social change is not a project that one group of people carries out for the benefit of another." Um, that's a very important, powerful quote uh, because I'm sure in your own life, in fact, that would be a great chat question. What's a change you've tried to make in your life before? Not necessarily social change, but uh, what have you? What kinds of changes have you tried to make? And you know, what was your experience with that? And uh, traditionally, government agencies, nonprofits are considered the primary source of solutions rather than the, the community members themselves. So a lot of times we want the government to fix something, or the corporation to fix something, or uh, you know, the educational system to fix something. Um, but in this framework, uh, the residents of each neighborhood um, and group who are familiar with what the issues are, uh, have the passion and the desire to improve their own community. And then they can drive those changes um, instead of the changes coming from outside into a community. It is a grassroots kind of a um, effort where the people that are most affected by the issues are the ones coming up with the solutions. Because uh, sometimes a solution from outside might create a new problem because it was something that's just kind of um, enforced on a community and may not take into account some of the other issues or some of the underlying causes. And uh, someone just responded in the chat. Yes. Hanat, Hanat from Nigeria says illiteracy and poverty, I think, is one of the challenges that they're facing with. Okay. And those two things actually affect each other. I mean, if you have a society uh, that is um, that has high illiteracy, you're going to have high poverty because people aren't equipped and prepared uh, to move forward in any types of careers uh, or ways of um, providing for themselves and their families. Okay, we want to continue on to the next slide, Alex. Okay, yeah. Can I dig into this a little bit more? Uh, from the uh, friends in Port Hardcore, they say some of the challenges in Nigeria uh, is a drug addiction, lack of direction. So they also have that in there. Yeah, yeah, that's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. um, and so, what we want to look at is, is, is a framework that will kind of uh, help us. Uh, Hanat says social media is also exposing some of the issues. It, it, social media is, 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 is an issue, but it also exposes issues. So, mm -hmm. yep. uh, so uh, we've got like a little, a little history here of uh, how the Baha'i community uh, has been utilizing a framework uh, that does help that that addresses social and economic change, but at the neighborhood level. Um, and here in San Diego, the Baha'i community has uh, been working in a couple of different neighborhoods and uh, is seeing um, how they can actually, especially uh, working with young people uh, to help them to uh, start to, to look at ways that uh, they can address issues in their communities. Uh, the current challenges have a spiritual root and need spiritual solutions. Kind of uh, Alex uh, alluded to before we went on break uh, that we're now wrapping up, but we're kind of going, coming full circle 
uh, because a lot of what we realize may be issues economically and socially uh, have that um, faith-based, um, that, that faith-based faith um, or spiritual root in terms of why those issues may be, may be in place. And so there may be a spiritual solution if the challenge is rooted in uh, spiritual issues. Um, and the framework in the case of, of Baha'i, it starts with home visits. And so you really do need to start with the individual families, the individual people, um, getting people to uh, start to talk to each other about what they see, what they're experiencing in their communities, praying with them, consulting with them, and helping, and out of those conversations, helping uh, facilitate a grassroots uh, approach or solution or an initiative uh, that the people in those communities are the ones who are actually addressing the issue as opposed to waiting for someone else to fix it. Um, and that is, the, this is with the concept that everyone is born rich, you know, what, how we started. Uh, everyone has abilities inside of them that maybe need to be cultivated. Uh, people have ideas. And so, and the, and the closer they are to the issue, uh, the, the probably the better their ideas are for how to address those issues. And then um, that everyone, every member of the community is involved. And by having the members of the community involved, you're probably gonna have more of a lasting impact than if outsiders come in and do something and then leave. Uh, then the problem is probably just gonna come right back. And we see that in a lot of our uh, communities over, over time. Uh, yeah, famine and poverty, uh, poverty is a big one. Um, if people are, uh, if their need, if their, if their physical basic needs aren't met, it's really hard then to deal with other things like education or uh, cultural and spiritual uh, enhancement if your basic physical needs aren't met. Okay, Alex, the next slide. Please. So, so maybe we can uh, continue to spend a little bit of time on the outsider that you were talking about. Uh -huh. I think we see that a lot, not only here in um, U.S. in uh, local communities, yes. but I was just going to put that into um, the chat. If anyone watched the uh, video for responsibility, which was the play pump uh, program, uh, I'll, I will I'll put the follow up. So the play pump program seems to be a huge success. It was great with a simple thing. They were doing it. Uh, and that project started, I think that video was from 2010 uh, or 2005, something like that. And there is a follow up video to it uh, that shows how the project actually fell apart uh, because it was initiated by someone from outside the community. Um, he had the best of intentions. He went to South Africa, tried to solve people's problem of water. Um, but then because the locals did not, not that they didn't see the value, but they, it didn't start from the local community. It just fell apart. And we see that uh, mm -hmm. all the time here in the U.S. I'm putting that in there. It's, uh, has anyone ever seen projects that are started by outsiders and not uh, sustained? So let's see if anybody has any, I can think of That's any project in your local area that started either by international groups or even somebody from outside the area come in and say, oh, I know how to fix your problem. This is your problem and this is how you're going to fix it. Right. So let's see if you have any examples. Right. I'll go on to, there is a, the next slide is a video which we will not watch. Hello, can I share? Uh, okay. Yes, yes, go ahead. Uh, Samuel, let's let's video? watch the video maybe after I'll share my experience. No, 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 no. The video I will share it. Uh, we won't do the video here. Um, we will. Okay. Uh, yes, go ahead. I I I am a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints in Kumasi. Every year we have a project that we help the community to solve community problems. So what we do is that we meet. You went, we meet okay. the community leader and then we identify a problem 
and the church members come together to help the community to solve the problem. One of the problems that we did recently was Please call in. One of the problems that we did recently was to tidy up the environment in such a way that we can prevent. Um, I wonder why he goes. Environmentally related diseases. Okay. So we did a lot of tidy up the, the environment where nobody um, can say that this is my house or like the open spaces where there are no buildings. We weeded the area, we distorted gutters so that the wastewater can flow easily. So that is what we've been doing every year. Okay. Now, uh, Samuel, were the members of the community involved or was it, did your church come and do it or did your church help the community members do it? That some of some of the community members join us during the program. Okay, great, great. And how long is it, how long have you been able to sustain that? We we do that yearly. Every year we do that. Okay, great, great. All right. All right. From the, there's a comment from our friend in <clears throat> Port Harcourt that we had a market project initiated by World Bank in our community and they decided to solve a problem. Uh, so what was the result? Uh, it, it, it would be good to know what happened. Uh, did it work or did it fail? Okay, maybe we can continue while yeah. we wait for that. All right, all right. Okay, what, what, what happened was that when they identified the, the market, they, they saw that women were going to a very long distance to go, to go for uh, marketing to sell their produce, their agricultural produce. And that was very difficult for them. And they initiated it because they came for a, a project in another community and then stopped by our community. And then when they saw women with huge baskets of, uh, of tuber product, of potatoes, of fresh, um, of fresh uh, uh, fish caught from the river, they were really bothered because fresh fish is caught from the river they were really bothered because they considered that by the time these women get to the market, this produce would have you know, gone bad. And so they decided to create a market in the community and they established the market. And when they finished, they had the issue of the women in the community owning the project because they felt that uh, the women in the community felt that since the market was in their community, Others will not come to patronize it. So a, a, a sensitization program was done to get these women to appreciate the project. And a follow-up was done and the formal handover was done. And then they exited the project until today. That market is a very functional market and it's it's has solved the problem you know, in the community. And women now can access the market. People come from outside to also access the market. So it solved the problem. Okay. Awesome. Uh, and I think we awesome. didn't mean that every project that's done from outside might be a failure. Uh, but so there are definitely a lot of successful projects. There's a lot of things that are happening that are great. Uh, but to a greater extent, uh, it's the involvement it uh, needs to initiate from within the community. That's what we were trying to say. Right. Okay. And so, um, we kind of talked around this, but here it is in nice little bullets for you to, to think about the framework um, and uh, how, to, uh, how, how to kind of address the whole thing. And I wanna stop for a minute on the capacity building because I think that is uh, the key to this, the kind of success uh, that we just heard shared. Um, the reason it probably kept going was because the capacity was there for the women to take the ownership, um, as opposed to someone coming in and running a market. Uh, the women still got to run the market once once they once they began to utilize it. 
they still had the ownership of it. It wasn't owned by someone else. Um, and so uh, what are some examples in your communities where you think uh, there's a need for some capacity building where the, the communities themselves uh, might need some training or some assistance so that they can own whatever uh, the process is or uh, whatever is going on in the community. Okay, that's, that's a big one. Yeah. Um, and then uh, education is huge. Uh, so really dealing with the, with the level of education and it's not, and sometimes it's just basic education for children, but education also means teaching people about different things that they may not be as aware of or uh, recognize. And so uh, are there examples in your communities where there needs to be um, some education on in different uh, industries or different issues? Um, I think one thing that's very obvious and that's why we are doing these programs is uh, majority of people who are connected with Mind Treasures, uh, they are learning about finances as this group is, but it's not just for their personal use. I think everybody has recognized that financial education is something that's absolutely needed uh, and nobody denies the need. However, the governments, the schools, uh, 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 whether it's local government or national governments, they have not uh, put in the resources that are needed to provide this essential education to the general public. Um, so I think that's one of the capacities uh, that's being built. And we are really asking everyone who's participating in this program. I have had direct uh, uh, contact with many uh, friends here that this is not the end. Um, so the, uh, the things that we are learning together here, the finance, whether it's financial education or from our cultures, whatever, it needs to be passed on. We need to not only teach it to our children, but hopefully in our neighborhood, in our schools. Um, so that's one thing I can think of. Um, let's mm -hmm. see if anybody else has um, other ideas of what capacities needs to be built. Mm -hmm. Let's see, is there, is there someone, something in the chat? Oh no, that's- No, there, there's nothing. That's your and, question. And, that's yeah, your that, that's a question, yeah. And yes. I'll go more and I'll go more into this in the next uh, segment. I'll go a little bit more into in depth into this detail. Um, so we can move on on this one. Okay. All right. All right. So let's go into the next slide. And okay, so what's next? Faith-based organizations across our county. And this was a presentation that we did here uh, locally um, to, to start some of these initiatives here in San Diego. Um, and so uh, we, we presented this to a group of uh, faith leaders across uh, different uh, religious groups and uh, wanted to really uh, put this out there for them. And, and we're gonna be working with some different ones uh, to start some of these initiatives um, because a lot of our churches are active in, the, in their communities. Um, we've got uh, mosques that are active and, and different groups. So for us, this was a good, um, a good way to kind of combine faith uh, and um, social action. Um, and uh, in your, in your uh, communities, you may be able to do something similar uh, where you can, um, like, uh, was it Daniel? It talked about, uh, how uh, Church of Latter-day Saints uh, has the, um, had an initiative. This is where they may be able to go in and uh, establish some, some other community organizations or group, community groups uh, that can address other issues. And the group is addressing it, not necessarily uh, the outside organization. And uh, Nari, maybe you can talk about the programs that your church is involved with the school across the street. You guys have oh, a yes. lot of programs in your church. Oh yeah, we actually do. It's just, it's grown over, uh, we, we moved into a site uh, about 15 years ago and uh, we're very, we were very intentional that we wanted 
to make a difference in that community. And, uh, and so uh, we, our pastor immediately went across the street, met the principal of the school, asked what are some of the issues you guys have? What can we do to assist? And the first thing they said was, we just need people to read to the kids. We need our reading to go up. And the way to do that is to have people reading. So a bunch of our senior citizens immediately volunteered and they go into the classrooms and read with kids. Uh, we set up a, a snack um, program after school so that as, because we realized parents we're parking their cars in our church parking lot when they go to pick their kids up. So we set up a stack program so that when the parents pick the kids up and bring them back to the car, they stop by um, our little uh, table and pick up a snack, an after school snack for the kids. Um, we uh, host different um, events uh, together uh, with the school, um, little uh, social things for the parents and the kids. Uh, so that's just been like an ongoing uh, relationship. Uh, we, we have a Bible study in, uh, in, as part of an after-school program uh, at, the, at the school. Uh, so we kind of like just work together on different things. Um, and it's just been, it's been a, an ongoing relationship uh, with, with the school, which has been very good. Um, let's so see. The, the last so, slide in here. And so here's just uh, some ideas about how you can go about implementing something like this. Uh, you might, uh, like those of you uh, at, at the uh, HP Map Center, maybe would have a discussion uh, today about some issues in your community uh, that you need to confront. And then you'd recruit a couple of people, especially people who live in the actual community. That's what we found is key, is having people who are in that community who will kind of lead uh, whatever the effort is and start talking to their neighbors and hopefully having those dedicated people uh, invite, like maybe invite their neighbors over uh, for tea and talk about the issues in their home as opposed to going to some institutional place, but so that the, so that the neighbors are talking about it and then having them meet uh, and pray about it, consult with each other, and then start to think about uh, how they want to address it. And then where you can come in is maybe letting them know about uh, possibilities, letting them know about some of the things that might be available to them. Because um, you know, here we, we have access to a lot of different resources, but people don't even know that those resources are available. And so this is a way to connect them with uh, some of the resources that are available but that, but having it be driven from the actual community members. And then uh, once they've identified uh, some of the things that they want to address and identified some opportunities um, to improve the lives of their neighbors um, and um, we can con we connect them with uh, some of the resources uh, that they might need to assist them in doing that. And uh, then they can then drive that whole process in terms of uh, getting some volunteers out of their out of those neighbors and organizing their efforts and then starting to implement uh, whatever it is that they they feel will address the the concerns and uh, we also have lots of partners that we can use uh, whether it's the schools or there are a lot of nonprofits or um, we have what we call here the care center that uh, kind of address, um, provides a lot of different resources to different communities as needed. Uh, but it's more a matter of uh, taking those steps to make sure not just that uh, community members are included, but that community members are actually driving it and that, and that they are initiating what they feel is most important for their community, not someone from outside saying, oh, here's what you need help with. And so that have, will make it more sustainable. Yeah. I think we can go on, Alex. Okay. Yeah. So we have one comment in the chat. Uh, my church recently uh, dug a borehole uh, that is access to water for the host community. Um, also healthcare outreach to IDP camps um, 
uh, where health services and medications are administered to them. Great. Well, so, that was, yeah, that was awesome. So there are definitely a lot of projects in here. I know mm -hmm. our friends in uh, Port Hardcore, they said they want to leave about now. Um, okay. We can, if, if you want to stay, we can wrap do the wrap up probably in 30 minutes, but it's totally up to you. Cause I think, Nari, we're done with this segment, right? Yeah, um, yeah I think I think we go down yeah. to the next slide. I think, I think, right. I yeah, think the, the, that was. Yeah, that's the last, yeah. The next slide is just a prayer for San Diego. So um, yeah, I think, I think. We can and, yeah, and, and so my, basically what I was gonna talk about was, but the, my challenge was not to procrastinate. Like not, well, since we've talked about this, definitely uh, find two or three people, think about two or three people you can contact this weekend to share this strategy and to get something started in your community. That's my challenge to you. Okay, so Alex, you want to switch over to? Yep, yep I'll, switch over. I'll, I'll okay. switch over to that one. Um, all right, so uh, this is the uh, last part of, that's not where I wanted to start, uh, the review uh, here. Uh, so just the, uh, this is going to be the review of uh, everything that we have done in the past uh, three weeks, or this week and then the past two weeks. Uh, and uh, so we started our program with looking at the spiritual foundation of wealth and finances. Um, and I know talking to Quentin yesterday is that his son who came on earlier um, the, during the first session said, Dad, I thought we were going to learn about money, but we got stuck talking about patience and character traits. So he realized that uh, our character traits, our treasures definitely um, have play a role in our finances. And that's, that's what we have seen. Uh, we started with the quote from Buddha, if we could see the miracle of a single flower clearly, our whole life would change. Um, so we began to talk about that our goal in life on this earth is not just to be concerned with material stuff. We definitely have to make sure that our livelihood is uh, taken care of, but also God has promised us not only once, but in many different sacred books in the Bible, in the Quran, in Baha'i writing, it all says that if we walk the way, if we follow what God wants us to do, then everything else will be added on to us. And we don't necessarily need to worry about our life necessities in here. And three distinctive goals have been set up for us as far as our spiritual goals, to know God, to worship him, attain his presence, uh, to prepare for the next stage of life, whether we are here on earth or in the next world. And then to leave a legacy behind, to be a service um, to humanity in here. Uh, we looked at, at this table that we put together, um, our finances, uh, we've been talking about last time, we were talking about how do we teach our children about borrowing. So our idea has been that our finances does not start at age 15 or 16. Um, that has been the, at least here in the U.S., for the longest time, uh, schools or governments, those that were talking about teaching finances, they wanted to teach it from starting from age 17 or 18. And it's like, it's too late by then. We need to start at a much younger age. And if you look at it, our finances really started from the point of conception in the mother's womb, uh, because the flawless, the, the flawless system that God has placed tells us and shows us that in the mother's womb, uh, during that nine months, mother provides uh, for the fetus. The fetus develops the limbs that it needs for this world, eyes, hands, fingers, everything. There's no need for them in there, but they're all absolutely needed in here. And then we come to this world. Uh, we broke it down into three uh, kind of distinctive uh, uh, times in our uh, life on Earth. Uh, first 21 years or so, uh, we learn about uh, education. We begin to get education, some experience toward the end of it, some money. Our parents mainly are, are supported. They provide for us. Uh, and then we begin to uh, gain active income through our employment, through our businesses, through our, entre uh, through our uh, entrepreneurship and so forth. Uh, but the goal is to, over this time, this 50 years that we can physically work, 
is to uh, transition from active to passive income. Because we know that at a later age in time, our physical body will not be able to support us. We'll have to rely on some sort of a passive income. And at that stage, we don't want to be a burden on the society and our own selves and our children. Um, so that is what's happening uh, to us, whether however long we live. But then also not forgetting that there is a spiritual goal for us uh, is to know God, uh, to love God, to have faith in him, uh, to be service to humanity, to sacrifice our own comfort and our own uh, desires for the benefit of others, uh, become detached from this world. Uh, yes, everything that is in this world is absolutely needed. Uh, but then we don't, if you don't have the chair that I'm sitting on right now, I can have a different chair. If I'm the clothes that I'm wearing, I should not be attached to it. The watch, the cell phone and everything. And lastly, to become uh, holy. Uh, thank you so much, Clinton. I see you guys. We'll see you guys later. Catch up. All right. Uh, then uh, let's see. So we uh, read this and th this was, uh, it's like the importance of doing, uh, being a service to humanity is because uh, I think all these scriptures talk about that us humans, we have a spiritual reality. It's not just the outer body. There is a spirit inside of us that survives those that believe that survives after our body dies and that spirit will continue to progress through the world of god or as it's mentioned in the bible it says that my father's house has many rooms and the baha'i writing refers to them as those different worlds that we progress to them until we attain the presence of god and this happens through the bounty and grace of the lord alone uh, through the intercession and sincere prayers of other human souls. That's why we pray for those who have passed on or through the good works and charities that are done in our name. So I'm feeling a little bit uh, selfish. I want to leave a legacy behind um, and not just a legacy that in our community, but the entire world. And this is something that I really love about our friends in Af particular in Africa and other parts of the world too, Nobody's uh, friends in Africa and other parts of the world, they're not, whenever I come in contact with them, uh, they don't just talk about, oh, this is something that we want to do for our community. Um, they talk about that, oh, this is a global, this is something that we're going to take all over the place and it doesn't matter how big or how small it is. Uh, we're trying to change some of the conception about finances. Uh, Wealth, uh, generally, if you look in any of the dictionary currently, uh, wealth is considered a large amount of money and possessions, material stuff. If you look at the definition of rich and wealthy, they have the same definitions in most of the uh, dictionaries that I've looked up. It says having lots of money and possessions. So whether rich or wealthy. So uh, Nari, can you type that in the chat? What is the difference between rich and wealthy? What do our okay. friends think? And later on, I'll share one of the, the a response I got from someone. What are your thoughts? Uh, who's considered a rich person and who's considered a wealthy person in your mind? So we are, while you're typing that response, we are now trying to change this definition to look at wealth, not only in the material form, but any resources, including but not limited to knowledge, expertise, time, money, and then as well as physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual powers. These are everything that we consider as wealth. And as you've seen throughout our program, we've been talking about all of them, our creativity. Uh, oh, I need to update this. The talent is not there. Our talent, our creativity, our passion. Um, these are all the different types of wealth that we possess. Then any person or all of us, all of us are, as we saw, all of us born rich, not with necessarily material life, material aspects, but we are born rich with character traits. Uh, uh, all of us have some kind of a talent. We just, uh, it's, it's just different between everybody. All of us have some kind of a passion. It's different between everybody. And then wealthy in our mind is the person that not only has these types of wealth, but knows and possesses the skills and desires to obtain, manage, and utilize all of the above types of wealth 
for illuminating the world, making a difference in the world. Yes, we need to learn uh, financial skills uh, so we can manage our personal family finances, but then essentially we want to help our community have that finance, uh, financial uh, security also. And then again, the entire world. So, so Alex. Yes, yeah, um, go ahead. Rebong um, says, rich is an accumulation of money and wealth is abundance of money. Oh, rich is an accumulation of money and wealth is abundance of money, fulfillment of one's purpose, gift and talents in life. Okay, very good. One time in one of our workshops, I, I posed this question uh, to a group of, I think they were in their 20s. And the, one of the gentlemen says, if you have, I think he said, if you have $2 million, you're rich. If you have $2 billion, you're wealthy. <laughs> and, and my response to him was that I'll give you six months with $2 million and I'll give you maybe six years with uh, $2 billion and it will be all gone. <laughs> he said, why? I said, well, because it has really nothing to do with the amount. Um, that's what people think, that it has really rich and wealthy. It all depends on the amount, which is totally insignificant. Mm -hmm. There yeah. are many people that have had a lot of money, uh, particularly celebrities, whether they are uh, sport athletes, that they gained a lot of money through their uh, uh, mm -hmm. career life, uh, but then they lose it all. So because they have not had the education, they haven't had the um, skill. Right. Uh, so uh, I promise that we'll talk about this concept that we call entrephilanthropy. Uh, so what we have done, we have basically taken entrepreneurship for philanthropic purposes. And often some people say, well, isn't that social uh, entrepreneurship? And when I looked at the definition, it's very close, <clears throat> but a lot of times I think social entrepreneurs are those that first they have an entrepreneurial idea. They have a business that becomes successful and then they begin to use the money or resources that they have gained um, to uh, do a social project. As opposed to this is that even let's say someone who starts a restaurant can be an entrephilanthropist. Uh, if, if that person can feed the hungry, those that come to pay, but then also have the drive and have the uh, contentment uh, to be able to feed those that even cannot afford. So that is what is our idea of entrephilanthropy. Uh, and we would, as you can see, we are teaching that to our children from a young age. Uh, we are not, again, starting our finances from later on in life, but we're saying that our children at birth, they, begin, they need to begin to learn these character traits because, again, I think everyone agrees that our children are being born with one of these in their hands. Uh, it's like, okay, the child is born, parents here, have a cell phone, just stay busy, leave me alone because I need to make sure I get my social <laughs> uh, 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 media time. Um, so... That is, that's why we're trying to really help everyone begin on this process and not wait until they have gained a lot of money. Uh, let's see. Uh, going back to, this is kind of like a follow-up to what Nari presented in the previous half an hour, uh, community challenges. There's a lot of community challenges uh, that we can uh, talk about and everybody has identified them. We love everything that's been put in there. Uh, I'm going to go a little bit more in detail of what the social action uh, that we presented is coming. What are some of the details of it? Alex, uh, yes. Alex just uh, quickly, Samuel in Ghana said, Rich is having sustainable sources of money to care uh, for, your, for your family's needs and wants. Wealth is having more than one need, uh, having more than one needs and having the ability to help others with their needs. Okay, all right. So those are all correct. I mean, everybody has a different idea on what wealth and what, what is rich and what is wealthy. Uh, so coming back to, uh, this is, a, a, again, expansion of what Nari presented is a little bit more in depth into it, is that what we believe and the reason that we presented our material, uh, we brought finances and spirituality together is that uh, there has to be coherence between our spiritual and material life. So far, in a lot of communities, they have been completely separated. We attend church on Wednesdays, Thursdays, Sundays, or whatever, 
and then we go to work. Uh, we go to mosques, and, and, it's, and it's the same thing in here. This is my spiritual time, and this is my material time. But now what we are hoping that everyone can accomplish is to interwove them together, bring them together. So whether we are at work, whether we are with our family, we're constantly thinking about our spiritual aspects of life. Um, so uh, the field of social and economic action and development seeks to promote the well-being of people of all walks of life, whatever their beliefs or background, it represents the effort of the community to affect constructive social change as it learns to apply spiritual teachings from all different uh, or uh, faith-based groups uh, with the knowledge accumulated in different fields of human endeavor. So it's not about, well, I'm a Muslim and I'm just going to go do my own thing. I'm a Christian and we're going to do our own thing. And I'm a Baha'i, I'm going to do our own thing. It's because we all live in the societies when we are intermixed. At least that's what we see here. It might be different in different parts of the world. But becoming together, um, and the, the bottom quote is uh, from the Baha'i writing, which says, for man, two wings are necessary. One wing is the physical power and material civilization, and the other one is spiritual power and divine civilization. And if you look throughout the world, there are many individuals, organizations that there have been trying to fix the challenges of the world just with material stuff, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's building a road, building a building, uh, the market that's been talked about. But until the spirituality begins to be infused into whatever we're doing, things are not going, probably not going to change. Uh, we already did this one. Uh, the projects that we start, they could be a simple project. Uh, <clears throat> we started Mind Treasures with just the thought of bringing uh, financial education to our community members. It was very small. We never thought that in 15 years, we'll be sitting here across the um, screens, uh, working with friends from all the way from US to Malaysia to uh, uh, Asia uh, and, and everywhere. Uh, but we were open to the idea. We just that it's like, okay, God, uh, guide us in, in where you want us to be in there. Uh, often projects start very small. It does, we don't need to sit down and come up with this huge project that, oh, we need, we're doing this thing because often the capacities, as Nari was talking about, capacities are not quite there yet. They need to be built over time. And then also the ownership and undertaking rest within the community itself. It has to start from the community not from outside. I'm going to go a little quicker through these. Uh, we already talked about this. Um, this is one that um, it's quiet. Uh, it's, it's, a big, it's a big change from things that have been done in the past. Um, if any of us knew how to solve these problems, we'd have already done it. Mm -hmm. um, so in the past, it has been, I do this, it's mine, it's me, it's I'm doing. I'm here to lecture, I'm here to, of course, there's still need for people to lecture, for teachers, students, and all of that. But the new way that's being presented is that we replace I, me, and mine with we, us, and ours. So anytime, like we do our financial literacy programs, we are not telling you, telling our participants how to do things. It's like, and, and you have seen, many friends have asked, uh, what, what kind of investments can I get into? Well, we cannot know, we cannot tell. But we have broadened this uh, financial intelligence uh, program because we felt that it can be a tool that you can utilize, that you can use to improve your personal family and community uh, financial uh, situation. So we all need into this, getting into this mode of learning that whatever project that the community picks, um, it is, uh, nobody says, oh, I know how to do this, or it's my way or nobody else's way. I know we all learn together. We all make mistakes. We all uh, make progress in here. Uh, and nobody is here, uh, the, the, the concept of followers and leaders. I know Nari and I didn't necessarily agree on this, but it's, it's been here. Uh, I particularly don't like to, uh, the, the concept of leader and followers. There are groups that start to organize things, to start doing things. 
And it goes back into, if you look into any of the sacred writings, whether it's in the Bible, Quran, Baha'i writing, none of the manifestations of God from Adam, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, none of them have ever said we are leaders of the community. They all consider themselves as educators of the community. And this is from the Bible. Uh, it says, just as the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So developing that attitude of we are here to serve together. I'm not here. I'm not, this doesn't mean that people don't have different positions. Each one of us have different position, different authority. Those remain the same. But I cannot say that, oh, I am the leader of mine treasures. I, I am not. I'm just like any other one. Uh, we all working together. Yes, ultimately, I, I need to some, make some of the decisions. Uh, but ultimately, we are learning. Every time we do one of these workshops, we learn something new uh, that we try to improve. Uh, learning, uh, okay. Uh, making sure that we don't uh, uh, repeat what we have learned in the past. So documenting what we do is very important. That's one, of, if you notice, one of the themes in our program was to be ask everyone to uh, write down your responsibilities, write down your time budget, write down your financial budget. Uh, and technology is our friend. I think often people have said, we use our smartphones for the most uh, dumb things that we can find. Just kind of sitting there and, <laughs> and doing this on Facebook, on our Twitter or whatever. Uh, but our phones are a lot more capable. One example was when we asked everyone to use the calendar uh, feature on their phone because it's very helpful uh, that can be used. Uh, I'm going to stop here because it seems like I'm just talking too much and I'm not um, used. Any questions so far? I have a, only a few more slides left. I just wanted to make sure I don't go too far and don't put everyone to sleep. Well, I, I don't have a question. I have a contribution to make. Sure. Uh, or let's say an observation. Uh, I'm happy to be part of this program because this program seems to be more than financial intelligence. It goes beyond that. It's, it includes um, development studies, a whole lot of development, uh, shifting development paradigm. So I believe that um, next time we have to find means of getting more people to be part of this program. And then also, um, to also give us the capacity to also share in our communities with our people. But I also believe that uh, it entails a lot said that if you want to do this program within a day for a group of people, they'll be, uh, they'll be very bored. So I think uh, one of the ways that we can use it in our own communities is to abridge some of the things that you are teaching us. Yes, uh, that definitely. Uh, this is yes, not something, yeah. Uh, Samuel, go ahead. Did you have anything else to add? Sorry. Okay, so that uh, we'll have a presentation that can contain every bit of whatever we are learning now so that we can use it as tool for uh, propagating this concept. Okay. Um, so yeah, de definitely. Uh, just before we end today, I will show you the, how you can uh, use the material that is in the online worksheet. I'll, I'll go in there. But you're absolutely right. It, it is a, a, that, that was a great observation that this is not just about finances. And we really take pride on that, that the program is not just about banking service and budgeting and everyone needs it. So hold on to that thought and then I'll come back to it at the end of where do we go um, from here. Any other uh, thoughts or anybody, anything, anybody else want to share something? Or should I continue? Okay, either they have all fallen asleep or, uh, well, the sun is rising here, so <laughs> it's time for us to wake up. All right, uh, so continuing with the social, uh, this framework that we are presenting, uh, universal participation is also the key. Uh, it's about when we start a project, again, whether it starts from a church, from a school, from a community organization, everyone in that neighborhood needs to take part of it. It cannot be, well, they will do it, I'll just sit back. 
And everybody, not everybody has to do the same, but everybody can. So uh, the projects that we've been doing here in our local communities, often there are people that are bringing food. Um, so if they're like doing an all day event, somebody, some families are uh, cooking and bringing food. Um, some are bringing snacks. Uh, sometimes people from outside of town have come to visit how the program is done. So some families have offered their homes um, to host people. But this is something that we have often forgotten about, the power of children and our youth. I think in many societies, we feel that, oh, they're children, they're youth. They just need to uh, go and play. And we see what's happening when we are having that mindset. Um, they do have a lot. In this uh, workshop series, unfortunately, we didn't have any of our youth. Uh, but previous ones we have had, like la the last series, we had one uh, 12-year-old uh, attending from India. There was a nine-year-old that was attending uh, with a parent in South Africa. So finding things that everybody can do, uh, because I think us adults, we think we know everything. We have all the solutions and we're trying to fix everything. And, and yet uh, we are kind of lagging behind on technology. Yes, we know how to turn on our phone and get on Facebook, but then rest of it, our kids know a lot more to do. So making sure that our children and youth are also involved in the process, whatever project we do. Uh, the capacity building, uh, I think we talked extensively about this. We need to build that capacity. And, and part of the uh, power of children and youth uh, in, in our societies, and I think as everyone mentioned, there is so much for them to be distracted um, and not concentrate. And they cannot follow the same path as their parents. I think this is something that we are at least seeing here in the US within the faith-based organizations, uh, including even my own son. Um, they, are, they can't follow the traditional way that the faith-based organizations have done, like attending church or mosque. Um, it's, uh, working with them at a different level, not let them do whatever they want, but then also kind of looking at how we can get them engaged at a young age and use their talents, their resources. Uh, a particular age group is age 11 through 13, when they're leaving childhood before they become their youth years. It's the year that their um, hormones are kicking in. Uh, at school, there is pure pressure in them. Uh, they are beginning to become more familiar with social media and all of that. So there is a bit of emphasis in, in that age group too. Uh, let's see. Uh, these are so just some of the logistics. Uh, any uh, thing that we do, we need to have a little bit of organization in there, uh, plan based on community realities. Um, it's like whatever project that's being done. Uh, should I look at and say, all right, what are the capacities in the community? What are the resources that are available in the community? And then bring what's needed from outside. Uh, often we expand, uh, sometimes we expand too fast, and then we need to consolidate a little bit. The Play Pump Project, uh, again, if you have not watched the Play Pump Project, definitely do that. Uh, it was, at the end, Trevor was talking about expanding all over Africa to build these to dig these wells and put this merry-go-around uh, that kids can play on. And he was saying that, oh, we're gonna go all over. Well, the follow-up, and I'll post it in, the, uh, in our WhatsApp group, in the follow-up, it was clear that he just went too fast. Yes, there was a lot of money that he received from different governments, but then that was part, possibly something that worked against him. Um, so knowing that we expand and then we uh, consolidate. We reflect on process, uh, on inputs, outputs, and outcomes. Uh, I know uh, in our societies here in the US, a lot of emphasis is put on, is, uh, placed on outputs. Like I give you this much money, tell me how many people are going to go through your program for how many hours, especially if government funding, they have absolutely have no uh, really care about what are the outcomes, how things are going to happen. As long as they get their numbers, they're happy with it. Uh, so it's really thinking about what are the outcomes and not being having preconceived outcomes. Uh, and then consultation, there's uh, 
becoming detached from personal ideas, that comes also from the notion of being in a learning mode. Because often we get attached to our ideas. We want to start a project. I have some idea. And I just keep on insisting that, oh, no, if we do it this way, I think it's going to work. It's going to work. And then we don't, I, if I don't allow the group to decide, um, then that is kind of does not help the project either. Uh, so the idea is that if I bring in an idea to the table, I present and I become immediately detached from it and allow the group to decide and move forward. If the group says, yes, it's good, then we move forward. If not, then we modify, we do something else. And then also if the group decides on a, something that's against what I had thought, it, I should not go around and tell everybody else that, oh, they didn't use my idea. They didn't do what I said they would do. Now watch them, they're going to fail. So that is not necessarily good either. Uh, I think we're almost done in here. Uh, the planning, uh, we have done that. Um, so again, on the outputs versus outcome, uh, really not having predetermined goals because often we don't know. This is something that we have definitely exercised in Mind Treasures. Um, people have asked, it's like, what is your goal in five years for Mind Treasures? And my response has always been, I don't know. I have absolutely no idea. We know that we need to present this material. Uh, and we are allowing the spiritual forces to guide us. I totally feel that that's what is happening in here. Of course, we keep track of numbers. We know how many people attend our program, how many hours we do, but that is not how we evaluate the program. The evaluation is uh, what the participants will be able to accomplish in their local community. And, uh, and then this is the last one that uh, whenever we start a project, we have to be prepared for challenges, obstacles, uh, patience is required, uh, and, and we can't, because often we want to be in a uh, speedy way to complete a project, and yet we don't understand that things need to, need to take some time um, to be mature. So I think that is the last slide. Yep, we're good there. So I want to stop. Um, see if there are any comments, questions before we talk about where do we go from here? Uh, what's the continuation of this? Nari, anything from you to add? No, I think that's pretty much it. Okay. So going to Samuel's uh, 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 recommendation or comment um, that we need to bring this to everyone. Yes, definitely. We need to bring this to everyone. Uh, from time to time, we will continue to offer these free uh, seminars. Uh, if you, some of you might have seen, we actually just scheduled a new one. It's a seven week uh, program um, done on Mondays. Uh, I will put it in the WhatsApp group uh, for those who are not on the other list. Uh, anyone who, uh, if you have friends that you'd like to involve, it's going to be in the same format uh, um, that can be presented um, and people can register for it and log in to do it. Uh, if you want to do this in your local community, I think that is something, a question that uh, uh, Samuel had. Samuel, is that correct? You were asking how do we do this in uh, local community? Yes, exactly. Okay. We have right. to. okay, so there are many various ways of doing this. So now that you have completed the program, uh, um, also, make sure that you continue doing your assignments. So I will send the assignments. Most of the lesson plans today still have assignments. Uh, I, several friends asked me what are the deadlines to the assignments. I didn't want to tell them that there's no deadline because <laughs> this is like, like a college course that you have to finish to get your degree or something. Uh, we will continue. You, you do need to continue with the assignments if you haven't done them. Many of the participants have done a great job in finishing their assignments. The one that we'll continue, we'll have to work on is the budget uh, and uh, income and expenses. So we'll have to do that. Uh, most of you should fairly feel comfortable that you can present this material. Uh, everyone has access to the, this online version that we've been using. Uh, but also if you go to, this says basic level facilitator manual, but then if you go into, so I wanna make sure from the table of contents on your worksheet, um, you can go to this tab. It says, I need to change that name. It says printable version. 
So everything that we presented is also available in PDF formats that you can download and print. And they are available in several different languages and we continue to add uh, to, as we get them more translated into different languages. Um, so you can see them. So if you can use the material in English, uh, you can go to this online folder. I'm just gonna open it up. And uh, very much everything that we presented is available in here. Let me do this by name, sort this. Okay, so there is the basic level workbook. Uh, again, these are all printable formats. They're open source. You can download them, you can print them. They are set up for double-sided printing. Uh, there is a full facilitator manual for the basic level, and we are working on expanding that um, to include the advanced material in there as well. Uh, the faith and finance and questions and answers, all of those are in there. So you can either take the printed material and organize your own uh, groups and, and do this. Or if we are doing uh, additional workshops uh, that they can attend if they like to attend virtually, uh, for any group that, had, that can organize like at least 20 or more people, uh, we might be able to organize a, uh, one of these uh, workshop series based on your schedule. Um, so that is possible as well. And then we can always help if you have any questions on how to organize a group, how to present a program, you can definitely do that. Uh, if you're going to be working with children, uh, so I'm gonna go back in here just to show. Uh, so for, um, we've been doing the program for uh, children as young as age eight. Um, this is what we do in our local schools here. For age eight, uh, and through, uh, this is grade three to six. Usually for grade three to six, we only present the basic level material. So all of these lesson plans, whether we do the online version or whether we do the uh, printed workbooks. Uh, then for those who are older, like 14, 16 and older, um, they start with the basic level and then we continue to some of the lesson plans from the advanced level. Uh, in schools, obviously, we cannot do the spiritual aspects of finances, uh, at least here in the United States, we cannot do that. But as you can see, a lot of the concepts are embedded in the program. So uh, we don't talk about it, but it's embedded. And we've been amazed as how uh, principles uh, have been open uh, to our program uh, the first, first five or seven years, we did not say that our program has a spiritual foundation, but now it's open. Parents learn about it. Um, they know that there's a spiritual foundation. We don't talk much about it. And then for uh, uh, adult and family series, like the one that we're doing right now, we do a combination of basic and advanced level. So that's how this program has been presented. Um, again, if you are thinking of doing a program for children, I really encourage you, I think some of you have seen, uh, we use this treasure box. Uh, let's see, the picture is there, yep. So we use this treasure box that teaches them the concept of spending, sharing, investing, and saving. And here's the treasure box. We usually get it blank, and then we give one of these to every student. Uh, they decorate it, it becomes personalized. And then in classroom, uh, whenever we do one of the lesson plans, uh, we gave them play money. So we have printed play money. We give them as allowance or pocket money um, so they can learn how to uh, begin managing their money uh, with play money. Uh, and it's, that is very interactive. So usually when we do our programs in schools, we do one hour to 90 minutes at a time. And we spend a good uh, 20 minutes to 30 minutes um, on this aspect of it. And in their worksheet, whether it's in their printable worksheet, I'm just gonna open up. Um, and, and instead of, it doesn't have to be a treasure box, it can be jars. I think uh, Michelle from uh, Malaysia, as part of her talent, she display uh, the jars, the three jars that she has, um, that she uses for her program. Uh, Maximus uh, shared his octopus um, that has the same concept in there. So everybody can get creative uh, create something, but th these, this is an essential element 
to teaching finances to children. Nari, uh, your input on this thing. Um, yeah, it, it, it really does give them a visual um, and it, and, and I always, you know, Alex knows at the end of the classes with the kids, I then challenge them because they get to take the box home and I challenge them to start using the box uh, with real money until they have, you know, enough money to open their own bank account if they don't already have one. And so it does help them to continue uh, practicing what they've been learning after uh, the sessions are open. Yep. Uh, so this is how we use it. Uh, we have the treasure box. Uh, then in the printed workbook, there is a register book on the last page of it. So when we give them allowance, uh, they learn how to split it between these different slots uh, before they put it in their box, they record it. So they begin to learn. Uh, this is basically just teaching them how to budget uh, at a young age. And then they also learn that the money that I'm uh, putting into save is for an item that I like to purchase, a smartphone or whatever that is. Um, and then over time, and we give them interest. So if you can see, I will go into the uh, online version so you can see it. Uh, so in the online version for children and youth, uh, we have the register book. Um, so they learn the different concepts of finances. So when they get their allowance uh, or pocket money, uh, they record it in here or in the printed workbook. Uh, we become their banker, we give them interest. So every time they put money into their save box, uh, they get some interest, they know what they're saving for. And they also understand the importance of why do we need to allocate money for spend, for share, and then for invest. And our idea of sharing and investing is not just limited to uh, money. Uh, we can share and invest all the different, uh, different types of wealth that we have, which we recorded in this sheet. Um, so we begin to learn all of that. Uh, let's see, Nari, what else? Uh, we, we have been talking about uh, doing a maybe two, three hour uh, train the trainer uh, mm -hmm. program, uh, but the prerequisite is for everyone. Anyone, once that is ready, you need to have completed uh, this workshop series, the ABCs of Wealth, done all the assignments, whether you uh, participate in the live sessions or uh, watch the recorded sessions and done the uh, assignments, all the assignments, because uh, this education is not something that you just present to others. Everyone needs to uh, implemented in their personal lives. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, for those who want to present it to others, to teach to other people, um, then there are some tips uh, that we can provide on how to organize a group um, uh, to, to what's happening. So I'm going to open it up for questions, uh, comments, because that's all we had to present. We can probably end early. Samuel, did we answer all your questions about how to implement? Yes, sir. Ms. Talens, you, you, you've done justice to my question and my concerns. Okay. All right. Very good. I'm grateful. Anybody else? Any questions, comments? Everybody, everybody was just so quiet. All right, well, if there's no nothing else, thank you so much everyone who uh, stayed with us through the uh, three week uh, program. Uh, I, I know Hanad, I know you're listening, <laughs> but uh, we, are, uh, we are pretty much done. Uh, like I said, we will send, if you have not received the announcement for the uh, next workshop series, uh, it's a repeat of this program. Uh, and it's actually very exciting, I can tell you that we have a couple of friends who've joined our network from uh, Vietnam and uh, they wanted to do this. And I asked uh, Maximus and Michelle if they would like to practice uh, what they have learned and they have graciously accepted. So uh, they're going to be facilitating part of the program. Uh, we think that it's going to be a small uh, group uh, in, in there, uh, but the timing definitely works for friends in Africa. It's going to be uh, Mondays uh, and it would start uh, Monday the 19th, uh, 19th of August, uh, July it will start. 
and it would be uh, it would be our local time is six thirty. I think in Africa time it would be what time is it right now? In different parts of the world, it would be it would start uh, forty minutes from now. So Monday the nineteenth, it would start forty minutes, and it will be two hour session. It will not be all day um, session. Uh, it would be just two hour per day. One of the things that we learned. Uh, with this workshop with our friends in Nigeria is that these uh, full day sessions right, and may not be easy. Uh, it was the first time that we had done something like this, uh, but I don't think we'll be doing that. Definitely not virtually. Maybe in person would make sense if you want to organize a uh, group to do this in person, even though that we really recommend spreading the uh, lesson over many weeks uh, because uh, not only they need to do their assignments, but then also share their learning with other people and then come back and then share with the group. Those uh, create a lot of conversation. And when we do this program in person, it's a lot different than doing it virtually. It's a lot more hands-on um, and a lot more interactive, whether it's, and, and what we have noticed is that it's most interactive with um, children. Nari, what's been your experience? You saw yeah. all different age groups. Yeah, definitely. Um, but even with adults, it's it's interact. You can be more interactive in person, uh, and it's it's easier to gauge kind of where the group is. Uh, people participate a little bit more. I, I know some people aren't as comfortable uh, trying to uh, interact and participate when it's online. Uh, just the mechanics of it, you know, getting getting the un unmuting and not wanting to talk over people. So it does make it a little uh, a little more muted, I guess, um, when, when we're online. Uh, but once you feel comfortable enough with the material and are able to uh, present the material in person, uh, you'll see there's a very, it's a very different energy. Uh, and um, and it, it definitely uh, feels different and and, and there's more uh, discussion amongst the, the, the participants uh, at whatever age. It, it definitely is much more interactive. And, and again, just one last comment is that we mentioned, uh, don't feel like this is the end of it. Uh, this financial intelligence is something that we all, we're all still learning here uh, because things change, uh, things are evolving, our communities are progressing, new challenges are coming up. Um, so it's a lifetime endeavor that mm -hmm. we will continue and involvement of parents is very important. One of the things that uh, we did not do here, uh, but it is part of the printed uh, version. Every lesson plan that we do in the printed version, there is a handout that goes home to the parents and engages the parents and the children in the conversation. So what we have noticed is that um, children have become teachers of their parents at home. They bring the education that they learn. Um, and then that has also created a two-way uh, communication because we are again doing majority of our program here locally at schools. Prior to uh, the pandemic, we were doing about 1,200, 1,300 students every academic year. Uh, and we know that parents does not, do not come to schools, but we needed to reach out to them. We needed to engage them um, so that's why those handouts were uh, created. The children take the handouts home to the parents. They uh, have a discussion about it. And then we ask them to bring it back with a, pay, with a uh, comment or a signature. And we receive a lot of results. Many parents have said, oh, I noticed that my uh, child is bringing, uh, was saving, starting to save money and teaching his younger sibling to save money uh, also. Hector has a question. Do you have a plan of the follow-up of this training to share the experience of participants of this training? We would love to do that. Uh, we would love to hear what participants have been able to accomplish. Uh, we will keep the uh, uh, WhatsApp group intact. Um, so uh, anybody who would like to uh, continue, we definitely would love to hear. That is actually the only thing that we ask. Uh, because we are providing this education at no cost to everyone, uh, the best uh, gratitude that we can receive is like, what have you done? How have you, how has this impacted 
um, your personal, your family, and your community life. And a lot, and a lot of people are uh, still engaged with us. Uh, we have several different uh, WhatsApp groups um, that uh, if you're not part of it, we can uh, help you to be part of it so we can learn from each other um, how to do this going forward. All right. Any other questions? All right. Very good then. Thank you so much, everyone, uh, for spending a few hours with us. Uh, again, we'll be in touch with all of you guys, and we'll see you later. I would like to. Bye.